And I have kind of found that, you know, if I do run into problems with a painting, it's because it's a problem with the design of the painting and not the paint. You know, it's, it's not putting so many, you know, if I put too many paint strokes or, you know, that's not going to save it. You know, a lot of times people will, you know, put more brush strokes on or, you know, try and do more broken strokes to, you know, either liven it up. And it's like, if you're trying to do that, it's usually, to me, it's like, it's, it's I, I haven't gotten the design right of the, of the picture. Oh, I see some of the paintings I recognize. How are you doing, Mark? Doing great. Let's just get that out of the way, make sure I've got enough volume here. Yeah, I was never really into video chat before, and we were kind of forced into this, and now it, I think, is going to be kind of the new norm, I even like once it. we get past this. I prefer it. That's the weird thing, you know? I because So we have my studio here, right, in this, where I am. I'm in my studio. And I and I'm taping it with big mics too, in case I need to. But I'd rather do this. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's easier for you. It's more comfortable for you, for sure. You know, you're in your studio. You get to control your environment, and uh, and yeah. I'm and I'm more than six feet away, and I don't have to wear a mask. Yeah, <laughs> but you kind of get a peek into everybody's studio and kind of their environment that they work in. True. You see the Grand Canyon. I love that. We sold that actually. We sold a couple oh, cool. of things already. Yeah. So this will uh, come out in probably about three weeks. So, which is wonderful. By the way, we're now live on the Art Dealer Diaries with Dave Mickle. And so you now you always sign your work Dave, David Mickle, but I, I know you go by Dave. So is it Dave for your friends, David for the paintings? Well, if it's something formal, I'll, I'll write down David Nickel in a professional setting, but my friends, I'll call me Dave. Yeah. So yeah, I've switched. Answer to both. Yep. Did you get your phone off, by the way? I didn't the other day. You probably don't even have a phone. You're so professional. You probably don't even have it on. Oh, I've, I've got it on mute. Yeah, very good. So what, what's up, David? Well, I just, uh, I got done painting. A bunch of paintings for you and then I've got a bunch of other projects waiting so um, I certainly have not been uh, bored during this whole pandemic. Um, I think you know for for artists being in quarantine is actually not a bad thing. Um, <laughs> unfortunately you know I think the circumstances are really sobering but I think you know the artist temperament we I think we tend to do well when you know we have time by ourselves or you know we can you know i think we can keep ourselves occupied oh yeah there's no doubt about it i mean you're doing nothing different than before really <laughs> i mean you know I, I an artist friend of mine sent a picture of an artist that said before quarantine it showed him in front of the painting working hard and then it said after during quarantine it was the same image it's like what's changed nothing you know and for you could you also have a, a day job right yeah. Yeah, that changed uh, pretty significantly. Um, in the middle of March, um, we were, it actually kind of happened over a weekend. You know, we went home for the weekend. It was going to be spring break. Um, so I, I work for the University of Utah. And um, over the weekend, that's when they decided to really kind of shut down the state. And right. so I, I ran back into my office. I grabbed my computer and, and I kind of, I know we'd kind of signed some forms saying we were going to be, you know, away for three weeks. And I thought this could be longer than three weeks. So I, I grabbed my monitors as well. And um, I haven't been back in the office since, but I've, you know, we've been meeting remotely. We started meeting every day by Zoom. And so we learned how to Zoom, use Zoom really quickly. Right. And uh, I learned that I could uh, do graphic design um, at home in the living room because I'd always worked, um, in our studio up in campus. I'd always, uh, I'm a graphic designer, art director, and I created everything up there. So I, I learned that I could uh, do graphic design kind of from anywhere. I, kn I knew I could paint anywhere, but right. you know, design, you kind of have your, your setup and, and things that you, you know, the way you like it done. And, you know, but I, I learned I could create too with the chaos of what's going on around at home. And so on a graphic design, are you doing that on the computer? Or are you doing that um, just- A majority like of it is on the computer. Yeah. Um, is that so, different from what you do in your paintings? 
well my the the paintings that are like behind me are are all um oil paintings you know done by hand um, right. very traditional um i have an illustration style that is a graphic style that is entirely digital and i've found over the years that it's you know it it's very nice to have a digital style because things change um, to get work where it needs to go to have it in the computer and be able to email it off or send it off it, it's so much nicer to have it all on the computer and so all of the, all of the layout all of the you know all of the design is is done on the computer and it's kind of been like that ever i've i've worked for this particular office for 28 years and i've i've you know worked on the computer the entire time so you know this is certainly how i've i've been working for a long long time this is at I know when university. I was in design, sorry? This is at the university. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I know when I started in the design program um, at the university, this was in 1990, um, there was a lot of, you know, talk about, you know, how computers would affect design, whether they should be used at all. Right. Um, and, you know, it was like, no, they just, they just <laughs> took over. The answer is yes, they should and they are. <laughs> yeah, and I um, was fortunate to get a job in 1992, and actually I'm still at the same job, and I was I was able to learn the programs. Um, that's when I started using Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator. At the time we used a program called Quark Express. Um, we've since moved over to Adobe InDesign, so it's all, all Adobe. But, you know, I was able to learn all of those programs kind of like on the job. I never really learned computer design you know from school that was you know i think they figured you would do that on your own we we focused more on conceptual ideas and things in school but uh i, I kind of learned you know computer design on the job so you did the graphics for the vp debate in salt lake city right so yeah a couple of days ago we had a big event on campus uh, the vice presidential debate and i was lucky enough to design the logo that was used for it. And then I was given the job to create the whole branding, you know, that was used on all of the banners and and everything on campus and outside the debate hall and, and all of that. So that's, and that's a lot of what I did all summer. You know, I was, you know, in my house, you know, working away and, you know, working on this um, debate job. So um, it, was, it was fun to see on, you know, some of the national news when they were outside you know, doing their broadcast and you'd see the banner I designed, you know, uh, behind, so. Uh, and the banner was, so you did the thing, you did the, actually the 2020 as well, the thing that said yeah. 20, and because you yeah. did paintings as well that were in the debate hall, I guess, right? Well, the, uh, um, those were uh, photos of Utah, you know, kind of beauty shots, but what I was able to do was a, an illustration of uh, the debate hall, it's called Kingsbury Hall, and it was one of my graphic illustrations digitally. And, and, you know, we had to do, you know, VIP swag bags and things. And we did a puzzle, a commemorative puzzle. And so that was my illustration that was used for that. But, you know, in design, you're using a lot of photography. And, and so a lot of the layouts, you know, because what we were doing was selling, you know, Utah as a location as well. And so we were right. trying to show off the beauty of the state. And so as, as a landscape artist, you know, I was looking for, you know, good landscapes that we could, used to show off and so, what did you use what landscapes did you use well we had a, a thing of bryce canyon we had some narrows in zion canyon you know i picked salt flats because utah's kind of known for you know the salt flats out west for bonneville speedway and um then you know some of our autumn autumn colors that we have in northern utah we have some you know alpine mountains and you know so yeah just i, I tried to kind of pick a selection of of sort of the landscapes that we're, we're known for. Did you, that's one of the nice things about living in Utah is we do have such a, a varied environment. You know, we have- Oh yeah, you do. That's a great state. It's a beautiful state. So and one of the most beautiful states, I think in the Southwest and the country, but specifically in the Southwest. Tell me about the uh, puzzle. Uh, can you give us a, can you get us a picture of that that we could put up on this video? Well- So he's getting, he's- I, I got one right here. He's got one right <laughs> so, here. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, so it says uh, Utah Debate 2020. It shows a picture of the hall. So like, and you know, this is, you know, this is what I do as a graphic designer, you know, they'll yeah. you know, figure out how to, you know, lay out the type and all of that. But, you know, it's, you're doing packaging as well as the, you know. And did they all say I voted for Kamala, Kamala Harris? 
No, I'm just kidding. Um, we had to be very neutral. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, you had to keep it completely. Yeah. yeah. But like, you know, one of the things I, that I happen to have here, so like, you know, we sent these boxes out to national media. And this was something I did in June. Yeah. But, you know, we're, so I designed, you know, originally just this logo here. But then the what you do is you expand out. out. Yeah. So, so for people who are not listening or only listening to it, it says 2020 in blue. And we'll put, we'll try to, but you can go to the YouTube uh, version of this uh, for the Art Dealer Diaries and you can actually see the imagery, the design. So you started that back in June. It's very catching, by the way. It was beautiful, I thought. Well, the logo was actually designed last year when we were doing the, the original bid. Uh -huh. um, or when we'd got the bid, you know, we had to come up with, you know, first the logo and then everything kind of, you know, expanded off of that. And so did you get to go to the debate at all? I did. Um, I was okay. able to, I didn't, I didn't get to go into the debate hall itself because they were very limited in the number of people they were letting in. They only let uh, 60 students into the, the debate. Um, but uh, I was able to, you know, get within the perimeter, you know, because first they have the Secret Service that set up a big fence around, you know, this area of campus. And then I was able to watch it in the building next to it. But, yeah. you know, fun to be part of it and, and kind of see the, the media tent and see the reporters outside. And um, it was a once in a lifetime experience. I, I think it's definitely a, a highlight of my uh, career at the university. Yeah, well, and you got to see it during a pandemic. So everyone was social distancing with masks and everything else on there. So that had to be kind of interesting. Yeah, I had to wear a mask the whole time. And, yeah. you know, and of course, every, we all took tests, you know, a few days before and, you know, you had to pass your, your tests to, to be able to, you know, be allowed in the perimeter. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Did you get to meet either of the people, Pence or uh, Harris? Oh, no, no, they were, you know. Not, not enough time for the yeah. art that makes it look beautiful. <laughs> well, there was a there was a lot of people from our office that, that worked on a lot of different elements. It, it was just, you know, it was a huge effort by a, an awful lot of people. So it was just it was nice to be part of it. But you've done other big projects. I mean, you've done all the signs, right, for the for Utah, for the Visitors Bureau. Is that what that, that the, the big sign? Well, was? I was uh, I was approached years ago to do um, the illustrations for the, the Welcome to Utah billboards. Mm -hmm. So when you drive into the state or even when you, you come into the airport, there's a billboard when you drive out of the airport and, you know, it says, welcome to Utah. And, and I was able to take that graphic style that I mentioned. I use Adobe Illustrator to kind of create just very flat shapes, very designed shapes. I was able to take that style because it works really well for a billboard. And, and I was able to create seven different billboards. And um, those are... I think they went up about 2008. So they're, they're getting a little bit old now. And I was able to see one of them over the summer and it was, uh, it was getting kind of beat up, but, yeah. um, but it, was, uh, it was fun to see. So if you look in the back here, I actually did a painting of one of those billboards. So I that's gonna that. be in your, that's gonna be in your show down there. Cause we took a trip to Monument Valley last year. Right. Went to the border and, you know, it was fun to see this, you know, the iconic, um, Monument Valley landscape and then have, you know, the, the billboard right there. And um, I had, when I was in, because I went to, to school at the University of Utah as well, and I was an illustration student. So we also took a lot of drawing and painting classes from the fine art department. I had this professor who was just obsessed with the idea of doing a painting within a painting. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I did these billboards, my wife said, you need to do this as a painting sometimes. So uh -huh. so when, when you go to Monument Valley and you're going into Utah from Arizona, you actually, one of your billboards is there that says, welcome to Utah. Is that right? Yeah, this, this exact scene right there. You'll, yeah. So you'll you took the scene of your uh, billboard that is yours, and then you incorporated it into a, what I would consider a classic David Mickle painting with uh, Monument Valley. I love that painting, personally. I think it's genius. And <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And so again, for those who are listening, not watching, you can see this on YouTube or it, in, we're having a big show December the 4th for Dave. That's uh, his first one man show with us, which is going to be really exciting for us and hopefully for you as well. And that painting will also be in it. It'll probably be sold by the time that uh, 
this podcast comes out. So if anybody sees it and needs it, you better call me fast. So we're, we're working on that as we speak right now on, on your on your show. So which isn't that far away, really. It's no, it's, it's coming up. So let's get back. Let's start off where you. Oh, I do want to ask one other question, though, on this billboard thing. So you also did the sign that was in Last Man Standing, the TV program, right? Well, they they took the bill, but they asked permission. But you know, they were. I think they were doing a. Uh, um, I think it was was it the Last Man on Earth? It was Last Man on Earth. Yeah. What? Yeah. I think that's what it was. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah. So they they wanted to film a scene at the border and they wanted to use that that image so they asked permission um i think life elevated you know is is trademarked by the state of utah so they didn't use that or they didn't use the typography um associated with that but um i was able to send them the artwork and they used it in the show yeah that was great yeah because i i saw the show you know i liked the show i watched it. i watched it for a while it was on for maybe four or five years right yeah, that was on. Yeah, and yeah I, I think seeing the show and going, "Oh, that looks like one of Dave's pieces," <laughs> and then it was like, "You said, yeah, that is my piece." I was like, "We should know about that. That's probably an important thing to know." Yeah. So I mean, I <clears throat> every so often I think, you know, the 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 elements of my career sometimes you know they kind of cross paths. I mean, graphic design is a very different field than painting. But my feeling is they're actually a lot more related than they're not. I very much feel like paintings are actually design problems. So I, I certainly feel like I learned much or more from my graphic design training. Right. You know, as a, it applies to my landscape painting. Um, so, yeah, I but it's fun when. Yeah, Dixon did had that same. He, he felt the same way that when he worked in a graphic design you know corporation in 1917 to 1921 he uh, he thought that was taught him more about painting than anything else that he had done in his life honestly so, yeah i mean it's great for composition color you know just getting your word and making a, a picture a painting an image that you know relates to an emotion or to some kind of a sensibility and I find personally that people who are in graphics who do illustrations like Dixon did with Foster and Kleiser uh, in San Francisco, that they really make some of the greatest painting painters, you know, whether it's an Eric Bowman or Francis Livingston or Dennis Siminski, you know, all these individuals or Greg Newbold, they're all, you know, fantastic illustrators that it yeah. translates and you're exactly fit in that same thing as far as I'm concerned. Well, I was, you know, I, I looked at Edward Hopper a lot when I was in school, and I, I know he had some experience like that. And then, um, yeah, Dixon's commercial work is very obvious. And yeah, usually I found the artists I looked at that I really admired, especially when I was younger, because when I was younger, I was interested in illustration. I, I looked at, you know, the, you know, people who were doing book covers and magazines. And, you know, as a, as a kid, I was, you know, certainly into Star Wars and I, I looked at all of the, you know, the, the artists that did the, the concepts, you know, behind those kind of movies. And to me, right. those were as exciting as the movie itself. And so I wanted to get into, into that. And I kind of found that, you know, I, I found I was really interested in the backgrounds and the environments too. And so I, I found I liked painting mountains and clouds and things. And so, you know, it, it was kind of interesting because I, I never had heard of Maynard Dixon until after I got, you know, out of school. Hmm. Um, but I kept coming across these paintings that to me were just like the perfect combination of graphic design and painting. And, you know, nobody had ever talked to about him when I was in school. And so, you know, I kind of felt like, oh, who's this person I just discovered? Nobody knows who he is. And then when you dig, you hmm. realize how famous he really was hmm. and is now. Yeah. But to me, he's just, you know, he's just that perfect combination of design and painting. Yeah. And BYU, of course, has you know, the mother load of Dixon's. They, they bought, you know, 85 paintings from him in 1937 for 3,700 bucks. Yeah. And Harold Clark, you know, worked a deal, the dean of the business school and got all those paintings. So Utah has the mother load of Dixon's. Um, yeah, and they um, sort of in the late 90s, I think they had a big show, yep. you know, so I was able to 
you know, really see some of his work close up. And so, you know, yeah, I've always just been a really, really big fan. And you have to hand it to, you know, um, them at BYU. I mean, they're big rivals for the University of Utah, but so it's hard to say this, but, you know, (laughs) they, they certainly had a lot of foresight in buying that work. And I think especially, you know, his depression paintings, which he yeah. wasn't able to sell at the time, you know, the, the, the person who looked at that and said, no, these are great documents of what's going on right now. And future generations will appreciate these, you know, to, to go out and, and, you know, buy those, collect them and, and save them when, you know, I think at the time, most people just didn't want anything to do with it. Yeah, that know, was Harold, I, Harold C. Clark, as he did it. He was the dean of the business school. Yeah. He'd seen those depression era paintings actually in the St. Louis uh, newspaper in like 1935, 36, and he reached out to Dixon. He saw, yeah, I mean, it, you know, that's what can happen if you have a collector or somebody who has vision. And Clark clearly did, and Dixon clearly wanted his stuff in that museum because he was selling them at a discount, a huge discount. So it was good for him, yeah. good for the u- museum. And then, you know, not long after he sold, 37, he sells it. By 39, he gets his his little uh, cabin in uh, Mount Carmel, which uh, mm-hmm. he would go there in the winters. I mean, in the summers, and you don't want to go there in the winter at all, but in the summer. He would be. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. You, you, you grew up, you were born and raised in Utah? Yeah, I was uh, born in Salt Lake. My, uh, my dad is a doctor. Um, so it was during the Vietnam, I was born in 1969. Mm. And, uh, you know, at that time, all the doctors were, you know, automatically kind of drafted in the army yeah and so you know a month after i was born my parents got a notice saying you know um welcome to the army they thought he wasn't going to have to to serve but he ended up in uh, aurora colorado so i lived there for for three years and then we moved back when i was three and my parents are still in the same house and i'm probably about a block and a half away from from that house right now so um my wife likes to give me a hard time that I'm still living in the same zip code I grew up in. She <laughs> actually grew up all over the South and, you know, her, her parents were from Salt Lake too, but she, um, her mom sold Encyclopedia Britannica. So she ended up living in, you know, Atlanta, New Orleans, right. Dallas, Nashville, and then came back to, to Salt Lake for, for two years for her last two years of high school. So, you know, she, she doesn't necessarily see herself as, you know, Salt yeah. Lake, and I'm sort of born and bred Salt Lake. And so, for those people who are listening, Encyclopedia Britannica used to be books that were the yes. Google of their day. That you would buy these huge sets. That I guess she would do door to door, or maybe she would call on different institutions and that kind of thing to sell them. But uh, you know, that that was how you got your information. It was through paper. Paper is a product that books were made on, and books were things that used to be in paper for those younger people who are listening to this and don't understand what that might have been. <laughs> you know, things change so much, it's amazing. But actually, Encyclopedia Britannica is still, it's a great resource, but it's online now. Yeah, yeah, and, and when I was in school, I certainly, we had a set, they were actually world book that we had, but I was always pouring through those to try and find um, pictures and, and things. I, I know now for, um, you know, when you have to do an illustration, it's so much nicer now when you can, you know, your your visual resources have expanded so much. I used to have to go to the library and you'd try and find things and you never quite found what you were looking for. And now you can usually find exactly what you need. If, you know, you haven't shot it yourself, you know, you can find something else out there and, you know, of course, change it up enough that, um, you know, you can you can use it but you know we definitely i think you know computers and the internet have have certainly made life a lot easier for you know artists and illustrators for everybody yeah art dealer i mean being an art dealer trying to you know get comps on things from was impossible and you had to go to auctions and write down this you know the prices to know what was going on and so now it's just all at a you know seconds click away which makes it great it makes things much more transparent and uh, also easier just to follow to know what's going on and being yeah. up to, date to the last second not just well five years ago there was a sale no you know what happened five hours ago uh, if there was one so you when you grow up in salt lake um you were uh how well how many kids were in your family 
Well, I only have uh, one brother. I think we were kind of unusual for, you know, a, 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 an LDS Utah family. You know, we're, we're kind of known for having, you know, large families, but we, I only had one brother. So I kind of grew up in a, a, a quiet house, which worked great for being, you know, an artist. Um, um, but uh, that's certainly different now. I, I have six kids and, and we kind of have a lot going on. <laughs> and so they but you were recognized early on right for your artwork didn't you win a, a prize early on as when you were growing up as a kid well i was always drawing um i was known you know as as somebody who who, who liked to draw and in church i was always drawing you know on the programs and you know i'd bring a or i'd have not a listening. sketchbook and, <laughs> not listening like well that was well, I'd, I'd be accused of that but i i'd always have an ear open but i i like to you know, a doodle on the, the side of the, the pages and stuff. Um, I, I, I think when I was in junior, I always wanted to paint and I always wanted to paint realistically. I've never kind of, I know when I was in, in, in college, they tried to get you to change, you know, and I, I never wanted to do that. I always wanted to kind of do exactly what I'm doing right now. But I know that um, when I was in, um, seventh grade I got a set of acrylics for my birthday and you know the the art teacher they they weren't teaching painting yet so you know I my mom hired him to stay after school at, for an hour and teach me how to paint with acrylics and you know, of course today you'd never be able to get away with with that but um, you know I was fortunate enough my parents were always very supportive of of me being an artist and and they were able to provide you know kind of things like that. And then I was very lucky when I was in high school, we had a really, really good art teacher. And, and I was kind of coming at the end of his teaching career. He taught at, uh, at, I went to Highland High School in Salt Lake and he'd been teaching at Highland since it started. This was in, it started in 1955. I think he was coming up on 30 years. And so I was able to get his last four years and he had taught some very notable artists already and um i was kind of lucky to to kind of get him as a teacher and he, he was the first one i think that really kind of said no you can make a career as an artist you can make money at it you know mm -hmm. i of course i think my mom was kind of concerned that you know, when she realized i was headed that way you know she thought i was gonna maybe have a life of poverty and he laughed and said no he'll be he'll be just fine and then I was I was extremely fortunate when I was a senior that U Utah has a program called the Sterling Scholar Program. So they usually pick a somebody from there's like 12 disciplines. And so, you know, they picked me for art from my school and then you compete with other high school students around the state. And I was lucky enough to win the Sterling Scholar for the state you know, of Utah. And this was in 1987. And that kind of gave me a, a pretty big boost of confidence that if I could, you know, if I could win this, I could, you know, I could compete with other artists around. And, and I was lucky enough to uh, get a four year, they called it a departmental scholarship to the University of Utah. And I'm not sure they, they give those out anymore. It was, you know, you pretty much were guaranteed four years of, of your education if you, you know, went into the art program. So I, you know, starting in the fall of, of 1987, I I went through it's called their foundation program, their foundation year, and all all disciplines in art had to go through this foundation year. And I'd always heard it was you know really difficult, and they were trying to weed you out. And and um, I got in there, and and I loved it. It was great. Um, so I was very fortunate to to kind of have that experience. And I but I was I was intending to be an illustrator. That was what I went to school to do. And um, I was lucky enough though, they, the program at the U was set up that you needed to do a year of graphic design in addition to the illustration program. So my sophomore year, and I, I took a, a two year break because um, you know, LDS people will you know, choose to go on a mission. So I, I went to England for two years. Um, I brought my watercolors with me. I was able to do some, some painting of the British landscape and cities and that. So in 1990s, when I started in the graphic design program, and that was, that was really, that hit me was how, how intense the graphic design program, the graphic design program was much more difficult than the foundation program. But I realized that a lot of the concepts and the ideas that I learned in the graphic design program are what got me through, you know, what I'm doing right now.
So what was that like going for two years doing your service? And, and uh, were you in England or London mainly? Where were I was you? in Manchester. So I was in Manchester, Liverpool, Preston. I was up in the north, north part of England. So uh -huh. it was very different than uh, the west because it was cold and rainy about 11 months of the year. And, um, you know, I think in Salt Lake, I think we're known for having, you know, really kind of a, a quality of light where you can, and we have very dry air, so you can see right. for a long way. And, and in Britain, you know, it's just, it's raining. It's, you know, and, and plus they don't have a lot of mountains um, unless you go to like the Lake District. And I love the Lake District. And there's another area called the Peak District and the, the Moors. So I do love the, the British landscape. I think it would be interesting to, to go back and, you know, maybe take some of the approaches that I'm dealing with some of the landscape here. At the time, you know, I, I didn't have a, a, I was doing other things, but I was able to take photos and do some watercolors. And so I was able to kind of keep my skills sharp while I was away. Um, but then once I got back into to school, I, you know, like I say, started the graphic design program. And then we also, you know, with the, you know, the illustration program, we had to take a lot of figure drawing and painting classes. And, and that's when I really started learning how to paint with oil paint it is from these figure painting and drawing classes. And, and that's after I, I kind of finished um, at the U, um, I kind of switched from acrylics. I was doing a lot of acrylics for my illustrations and I just realized, you know, oil is just, you know, it's really the medium I love. And so I, I really, I don't do watercolor anymore and I really don't do acrylics anymore. You know, I just, I love oil painting, but uh, like I say, you know, it's it, now I do a combination of digital for my, you know, design and illustration and then I paint, you know, with oil. So I want to go back to England because I'm not done with that. Okay. <laughs> so do you, first of all, have you ever been back since then? Yeah, um, I went back in um, 2001. This is before September. It was in May. Yeah. So it was before a lot of what happened after September 11th. Um, and I, but I was in the South. We went to Cornwall and um, Southern Wales and, and London. And I haven't been back to the, the Lake District or the, the North. Um, so, but I, we actually, when I finished my two years, my mom came and picked me up and, you know, we, and I, I learned to, I, I learned to drive over there. You know, I, I didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Yeah. Did you know how to you know, drive at all before you went over there at all? Oh, I could drive. I, I knew how to drive a, a, an automatic, you know, yeah. I had an international scout that I drove to high school, but it was yeah. automatic. And so, you know, when I was trying to get my driver's license over there and I had to learn the stick shift and I didn't know what the clutch was and right. why you needed that. And, and so trying to stay on the left side of the road, you know, and, and shifting with your left hand and, and all of that, it was, right. it was kind of a challenge, but I, I was finally able to do it. And so by the time I finished, we rented a car and we drove up to Scotland and, you know, really far north. And so I, I just love the, I love the landscapes of the north. We went to stop at Hadrian's Wall and, um, you know, went to Inverness in Scotland and, you know, we're in Loch Ness. And, you know, so I, I do freely admit I'm an Anglophile. I love the, the culture and the, you know, the cities and yes. I, lo I love everything about uh, Britain. And what's that like to do two years of service like that for the church? Is it, uh, you know, I've really never, I have a lot of painters that are, that are Mormon and, and have done this, but I never really asked them, you know, what's that like for two years? Cause it's a, that's a stressful thing. You're young, right? You're like 20, 21 kind of thing. No, we're 19. When I, when I left, I was 19. Yeah. And so, um, and of course for me, is it my first time, you know, first time away from home. Right. Um, zip code. First time out of the zip code. <laughs> well, I, I traveled a lot. I, my I'm mom loved to kidding. travel. I'd been to Europe when I was 14. Yeah. Okay. So, that actually helped me a lot because we went to Germany and, and kind of over the continent and then to England. So when I came to England in 1988, um, you know, I'd already been there. So I, I kind of knew what it was like to be outside of the United States. But right. one of the things that happens though, is I think, you know, we, we see places as, as tourists, but when you're there, especially in what, what we were doing, you live there, you know, you're right. living in a, a real place with, you know, real people, that you see day after day, you're part of the neighborhood, you know, and, and in our case, you know, we're knocking on doors 
you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, talk to people. It's not like, you know, as a tourist where you just go by and take pictures and right. you know, right. go into the museum, you're, you're trying to engage people. So, you know, you, you do learn, um, you know, you, you do learn, I think what people are really like, you know, away from where you live. And, and that's where I, you know, I really love the people of England. You know, they were, of course, most of the people aren't really interested in what you're, you're trying to tell them. But right. if you were polite, if you were nice, and if you respected them, I found they were very nice back. So yeah. I never had any problems. If they weren't interested in, in what I was trying to say, I was still interested in, in listening to what they had to say, what their views were. And it was, it was at an interesting time because when I got there, you know, the Cold War was still kind of in full swing. Um, and when I left, you know, the Berlin Wall came down in, you know, like 89. Right. We were there, we were in England when um, the wall came down. Um, I know we actually had some missionaries that were, you know, specially sent over. They were the first East German missionaries they were allowing out of the country. They were, you know, in our, there was one guy who was in our mission and, you know, boy, when he went home, he went home to a different situation altogether. You know, I felt like when I came home, the wall was down, you know, things, things really changed. Yeah, yeah, that was a big time change, no doubt. And so, and did you get to go to any of the museums while you in when you're in uh, England at all? The well, Tate? I there was a a Tate there was a Tate Gallery in Liverpool, and mm -hmm. so I was able to go visit that. I think it was an extension of the Tate Gallery in London. Um, and there was, you know, each city kind of would have an art museum, and you know, I I tried to visit. We have you know a, a day off that you can go, and they, we were encouraged to you know, visit places like that, you know, so we can learn about the culture and, you know, appreciate the culture that we're living sure. in. So, um, and that's when I, you know, would, would do, you know, a lot of my watercolors or, you know, we'd, we'd go around and, you know, take pictures. And so I, I was able to, you know, really kind of, I, I think that's what I really took with me is that love of that culture. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, because yeah. you were what, you had already done two years of of art school or at the university? No, I'd only done I'd only done a year, so I had okay. finished the foundation year. So actually, I left at kind of a good time. So I, I've you know everybody does the foundation year, and then you break off into graphic design, drawing and painting, illustration, sculpture, photography, um, film. I think like filmmaking might have been part of that at the time, but everybody had to go through that foundation year. So one thing that was good about the foundation year was we were were hit pretty hard with art history. You know, we had a year of art history mm -hmm. in that year. So, you know, I had a pretty good appreciation of, you know, what, you know, what art was in museums and, and, and the history behind, you know, some of the, and the art history also covered, of course, the architecture and things like that. So, um, I, again, I feel like that was the real benefit of, of that education I got from the university is it wasn't just teaching the skill of doing a drawing, it was the, you know, the art history, the, you know, the concepts, you know, the, the ideas behind the work. Um, yeah, that's you know, important. I, I think that's really important in, as, as an artist to have that background. It really uh, uh, sets the tone. It's like a doctor and your dad was a doctor and you know, but, you know, you have to learn the terminology. You have to understand all the, the nuances of the human body and all that stuff before you can really become uh, a well-rounded physician. And I would think that's the same with a with an artist that you really need the background and, and your own cultural history of what you're coming from, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we we had to do a couple of upper division art history, history classes, excuse me. So I did you know, a modern art class and then I did a, a class that the professor was really great. He was actually the Dean of the uh, Fine Arts Department, but I, I didn't think I'd like the, the course, but it was on colonial era painters. It was like, you know, Benjamin West and John yeah. Singleton Copley. Yeah. You know, and I was into, you know, landscape painting at, at that time, too. And, and so I was like, oh, this, you know, this isn't going to be interesting at all. And, and this professor made it so interesting and so fun. And, and it really kind of tied in a lot of the history of, you know, the beginning of the United States. And so right. I, I really, you know, really enjoyed that. And then, of course, um, when I was in the graphic design program, we, we learned a lot of graphic design history. Um, you know, there's some very specific movements and things that, you know, came about, you know, in the early 20th century that still, I think, affect, you know, things that we do today. And so, you know, that that's certainly, I think, is the benefit of, you know, 
because I think, you know, with what we're, we're doing at the university right now, you know, where you're trying to sell the idea of a university education, I think people wonder, why should I pay all this money to get this education? What's in it for me? And, and I think, you know, the, the, you know, these things that you learn, you know, you, you just don't learn at a technical school. Um, you know, this overall, you know, experience and then this background. And like you say, you have to, you have to have the knowledge of what's been done before and where you, you kind of fit in as an artist. So even though I'm, you know, I, as a landscape painter, I'm, you know, probably fairly traditional and, you know, I, you know, painting realistic stuff, painting realistic Utah landscapes isn't that, uh, you know, out of kind of crazy here in Utah, but I think having that background though of, of, you know, sort of the art history, the modern art, you know, knowing about, you know, some of the graphic design movements and stuff that, that certainly influences what I do and has, has certainly been a great benefit for my, my artwork. So when you graduate from the university, you got your BFA, right? Yeah, I got my BFA in illustration and graphic design. So I did a double emphasis. And you got a master's too, right? Did you do that right after that? Or No, no. Oh. I, um, so I, I graduated in 94 and mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to get the job I mentioned, and actually the job I'm still working at at the U in 92. There was a student position open at a place called DCE design so it's a division of continuing education they had an in-house design studio so i i worked two years as a, a student designer and then in 94 when i graduated a full-time position opened up and so i became a full-time designer for this this group and so all the rest of the 90s i, I worked full-time as a designer hmm. but i also you know I, I discovered landscape painting you know we had some really great professors to, who taught plein air painting and I was able I went on a really fun trip with these professors we were able to get college credit down to Moab and that's when I, I really realized I could paint landscapes every all day every day for the rest of my life so when I well, graduated I want to hear that that's what I like to hear <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a great great experience so when I graduated even though I worked during the day I had a job I had you know the benefits and all of that everything I needed I still painted. I came home at night and I'd always have some kind of a painting, a landscape painting, something I wanted to do. And so I kind of did that the rest of the 90s. I knew I wanted to, to sell in galleries, but I didn't quite know how to approach galleries right. or, you know, and plus I was, I was pretty slow, you know, and I think you probably see that when artists first come out of school, they, they're not quite sure, you know, who they are yet. And so, you know, a pain that would take me like a couple of weeks now would probably take me three months back then, you mm -hmm. know, and so I do this painting and then, you know, you'd take a few weeks off and then start another painting. Um, but I was learning about color and, you know, trying to apply design, some of the things that I'd learned from design school for these paintings. And, but I wasn't having, you know, really that great success. I was, I was entering shows and I, I'd get in some of them. Sometimes I wouldn't get in. Um, there's a, there's a pretty big show here in Utah called the Springville Spring Salon at the mm -hmm. Springville Art Museum. Springville Art Museum is one of the oldest museums right. here in the state. And so I, I always tried to enter that and, and I started having some success with that. And I started kind of selling paintings from that and the, the director would say oh people like your work and but they don't know who you are or, or you know and but I was you know I was still you know like I say working full-time and I was doing some freelance illustration too but you know things really kind of changed for me and you know around the you know 2000 2001 um, you know our, our office we kind of went from just working with continuing education to working with overall campus um, I met my my wife to be um and when we got married in 2002 one of the first things she kind of suggested is that i go back to graduate school and so i was lucky enough to be able to starting in 2003 go back to graduate school while i was still working my bosses were you know supportive of of that and it was um from like 2003 to 2005 when i was in graduate school i think that's where i really kind of learned how to um, kind of produce bodies of work. You know, mm -hmm. I could produce individual paintings, but in graduate school, and, and it was a self-directed program, and I went 
back to the you, which in a lot of ways, I think there's a lot of professors that will tell you that's a mistake. You know, you don't want to go to the same school that you did your undergraduate work in because mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, those professors, right, you know, exactly. I'd, I'd already been there, you know, been there, done that. But, you know, with graduate, with the graduate program though, it was entirely self-directed. You know, you come up with a concept for your show, you come up with, you know, you know, the theme and, and the thing that I found was interesting is they would kind of tell you, well, maybe you should think about this, but they couldn't make you really do anything. <laughs> you know, they couldn't make you change, you know? So when I came in, they were like, oh, you know, landscape painter, that's kind of boring, you know? Maybe you should think about, you know, maybe some video stuff or, you know, maybe, you know, try broken strokes and, 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 you know, I had, I'd listen to them and I, I try and incorporate what they, they were saying if it would apply to me. But also though, it was like, I knew I had to produce this body of work for the show at the end of this two year program. And I kind of figured out what I wanted to do as an artist and I just kind of did it. And it was different from, my day job where you know what the client tells you that they don't like something you know they gotta you gotta change it you don't have any choice but here it was like well you should just think about it you know and i thought about it and i'm doing what i want and you know so <laughs> when i finished you know i was I, I i had this body of work that i was able to kind of get into a gallery pretty fast afterwards and and i was lucky enough too that um i sold quite a few of the paintings that i did for my mfa show right and and actually because i worked for the u i got half tuition so i actually made a profit <laughs> out of going to graduate school <laughs> and then in in 2006 i was i actually won first place in the spring salon with a big painting that i did um and that helped get me into a a really good gallery in salt lake and once i got in in that gallery and they started selling my work consistently you know, I kind of haven't, I kind of haven't looked back. I've just, I haven't ever had any time to just, you know, like, you know, take breaks because there's right. usually been, you know, somebody needing something or, you know, a show's coming up, I got to get ready for it. And so ever since 2006, I've just been, you know, kind of painting away. Yeah, well, that's why it's for you. I think almost all my artists almost exclusively work, uh, paint full time as an artist, right? And you, you do too, but you're doing it on top of your other job. You're doing two, two at the same time. And, and I understand, you know, you've got six kids, right? And, I do. You yeah. Know, you got to have health care and all the things that go along with it, but it does, it has to make it tough for you, right? Well, the, the thing that's nice though, is, is I enjoy the job that I have during the day, the graphic design job at the U. Yeah. Um, is really exciting and you know like we talked about earlier i think you know working on this project like i just finished and and i think there's something to be said about you know going into a studio and working with other people and and i think being part of a team and um you know kind of having to to kind of deal on a professional level with with a lot of things i think has really helped my painting career but it also is nice because i'm not like alone in the studio all the time you know, I'm going into meetings, I'm, you know, kind of dealing with, you know, with, with clients and things and, and, and making deadlines. And I think a lot of times that discipline, when you can apply that to paintings and shows and things, you know, it's like, you, you know, if you go, okay, I've got three months to do this show and I've got to do, you know, say 10 paintings, you know, rather than I think be paralyzed with, well, I don't know what to do. And it's like, you just do it because yeah, you have you know. no time you have to. I find that true for all the painters that are, that are illustrators or were illustrators. They're super good about being on time for their uh, commitments. They always get their, you know, their shows done properly and on time and ahead of time usually. And I think it comes with that discipline of being in, you know, working in graphics and illustration. Yeah. One of my bosses at work actually had a good comment. He said, you know, if you want something done, give it to a busy, give it to a busy person. Yeah, they'll, they can, get they'll, they'll <laughs> utilize their time to, you know, get it done. I, I, I thought it was interesting when I was in graduate school, you know, they, they found out <clears throat> that I was working, even though I was working for the university, you know, one of the professors said, you need to quit. And, and then I just, you know, I, we, we just had my first uh, um, kid and, 
you know, I, we, I needed the insurance and I was like, I'm not going to quit. I can't yeah. do that. I just never brought it up again, but they were saying you need to be, you know, immerse yourself in this program. You need to be, you know, around these other artists. You need to get all this, you know, this work done. You can't just right. be a part-time student. And, you know, but the, what I found though, is that if you just worked really hard, which you normally do, you know, by the end of that first semester, you know, we all got together and we, we, we kind of laid all our work out and, and I had done like all of this, but I kept bringing work out, you know, and there was a couple of people that had only done like, you know, two or three paintings the whole semester, you know, and, <laughs> and I had done about, you know, probably 15 or 20, you know, just in that one semester, because I had this professor who was pushing me pretty, pretty hard, you know, I was doing, you know, a couple of, a couple, at least a couple of paintings a week, which, which in a way I like to say, you know, before I went to graduate school, it, it, I had to do put together a portfolio of about 20 paintings to get in. And those 20 paintings had taken about seven years, you know, to do. Right. But in those two years in graduate school, I probably did about 40 to 45 paintings in two years. So I, I learned pretty fast how to just like, you know, just focus and, and get it done. So, yeah. Well, and that's right. And it's clear. I mean, you know, your and your paintings are detailed paintings. I mean, they're not ones that can just be, you know, knocked out. There's a lot of time that goes into these clearly. So, well, I think over time I've kind of, you know, learned, you know, a, sort of a, a process that, that I'm most comfortable working. And, and I have kind of found that, you know, if I do run into problems with a painting, it's because it's a problem with the design of the painting and not the paint, you know, it's, it's not putting so many, you know, if I put too many paint strokes or, you know, that's not going to save it. You know, a lot of times people will, you know, put more brush strokes on or, you know, try and do more broken strokes to, you know, either liven it up. And it's like, if you're trying to do that, it's usually to me, it's like, it's, it's, I, I haven't gotten the design right of the, of the picture. Um, but I do, I do kind of go back and forth. I do like the simplicity that you, you get from certain, you know, like with Maynard Dixon, you know, he's very, um, precise with his shapes but he doesn't do a lot of you know he doesn't do a lot of surface noodling you know he, he just puts the shape on and he, he's able to leave it yep. and I think whatever it is in my nature where it's like you know I, I looked at Andrew Wyeth a lot you know I like his surfaces and I like you know the paint to kind of have a little bit of a sparkle or, or something going on so I do find even though I, I do look to you know, I mean, I love Ed Mel's paintings, you know, just how, you know, the shapes are just so perfect and, right. clean and you know, I, I look to artists like that and then I find myself just, you know, I just double down on, you know, kind of putting, you know, the, the, the little details and things on. But in a way, though, I think that's okay because that's what, you know, I probably, you know, doing that is what, you know, makes my work hopefully a little bit different from, you know, other artists. Oh yeah, it definitely is. It sticks out. In fact, you know, we might discuss it just how I found your work. Actually, I was up to the university museum. They were doing some big show. I know Billy Shank was in it and Shanta Begay. And um, do you remember the director who was there at that time? Um, was it Donna Poulton? It was Donna. Yeah, it was Donna. Yeah. She was great. I love Donna. Yeah. Great writer as well. And shout out to Donna. Hi, Donna. Um, but I went into a building, I had like one day off uh, before the show, and it was a major like shopping, high-end high shopping building, and I know you'll know the one. What is that yeah. building that I'm trying to... Well, it's the I, City I, Creek Center. That's it. And there was these monstrous uh, murals in there. How many are in there? Two? And well, I just had the the one. They they kind of came to me and said, "We've got." I think originally they were going to have a window in there. They were going to have this window that was looking out over the food court, and then they filled it in. And so they had this space that they needed um, something there. And one of the architects um, liked my work, and he came to me and he said, "Do you think you could do a painting for that?" And it was like close to ten feet tall by twenty three feet wide. Yeah. And so I had never done anything that big before. But, you know, it, it sounded like sounded like fun to do. And they, they provided me a space to, to paint it. And, you know, um, yeah, it was uh, it was a lot of fun. To, so that this is probably about 2010 when I I did that. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, well, I saw it probably I don't know what year that show was, but it would have been maybe six or seven years ago. 
And I remember seeing it, walking in and going, my God, who is that? Who did that painting? That's a fantastic painting. And I didn't know who you were or anything. I thought, geez, Louise. Uh, and that night I saw Donna at the opening and I, and I mentioned, I said, you know, I saw this fantastic painting in this building, some guy named Mickle. And uh, she goes, oh yeah, she goes, he's a great painter. I remember she said, he's a great painter, but he's not known outside of the state of Utah yet. And then I thought, wow, well, he sure, he sure should be because <laughs> this guy can paint. And then I guess she told you maybe that she mentioned it to you because not long after that, I got the most professional looking thing in the mail that was your paintings and things. And you had said, yeah, you know, we had talked and I was like, oh yeah, I'm definitely on board with you hundred percent. Is that how you remember it? <laughs> well, she, I know she, uh, she emailed me and cause we're, I'm good friends with Donna. She's been a great supporter over the years and I've been in some books that she's written and, and yeah, she did the Utah these. painting Canyon books, right? Yeah. Your back cover yeah. as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And she did a book on the Tetons and yes. So yeah, she's, you know, I think, you know, here she's just, uh, you know, been a great advocate for Western landscape painting. And so, yeah, she's definitely been an ally, but anyway, she reached out to me and said that she'd talked to you and had passed my name along. And she said, he, he, you know, he may contact you, you know, but if you don't hear from him, you know, send him an email. Right. And, and I thought, well, you know, if, and this goes back to my graphic design days, you know, because at the end of our program, you know, we, we learned how to, you know, do our portfolio. And, you know, we, we actually talked about, you know, the idea of doing a leave behind portfolio. So like when you go to an ad agency, you know, there's a way to remember your work. And so I, you know, I kind of thought, well, you know, I could send you an email and, you know, with some, some images attached, but I'm sure you get a lot of that, a lot, you know, it's really easy to ignore email. Yeah, and you get one a day from artists wanting to be represented. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've found that that yeah, usually if you if you do that, you don't ever hear back. And I thought, you know, I could, you know, it make a better impression if I could, you know, do something physical, because I think you know now in the world, you know, we're just so used to sending texts or you know emails right. or, or whatever. And so I was able to kind of take some of the the skills I'd learned from this program, you know, where we we you know and back in those days you built your own portfolio mm -hmm. um, you know you'd paste things on boards or if you were going to do a leave behind portfolio you tried to figure out a cool way of you know making an impression so i just thought you know we i'd get these you know prints of my work and you know i just got a sketchbook and then i you know i glued some other things yep. on just to, to dress it up but really it was it was just on a sketchbook and you know send send but it I off to you and, it i remember seeing the prints there are actual prints of the paintings. And I thought, and it's a great way to show them, right? I mean, that was a fantastic, this is for anybody who's listening, who's an artist or trying to figure out how to get into a, a gallery, especially maybe a higher end quality gallery. This is the kind of thing that works if you know that somebody already has an interest in your work. Because I remember going through it and thinking, wow, this is beautifully done, super professional. I love the imagery because I'd only seen one right up until that point. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, this is a no brainer. So yeah, I, I like to tell people too, you know, when they ask, well, how do you get into a gallery? And it's like, you, you have to kind of take that extra step, you know, um, I think to, to stand out, you know, you have to look for ways to, you know, cause there, there's a ton of people, you know, that, that I think do what I do, you know, that, that paint landscapes, that paint the West, um, you know, I think as an artist, you're always trying to figure out how can you be a little bit different, you know, what, you know, what, what can you do that's, that's different, you know, from what the other people are doing? Because I, I do think about that a lot is, you know, you, you look at what Maynard Dixon's done or other people and, you know, in some ways, um, you know, we are looking at the same landscape, um, but everybody has a different background. You know, I think their experiences are different. I mean, even though I do like graphic landscapes, you know, I, I do tend to, you know, I've mentioned before, you know, as a kid, I liked science fiction artists. I, I'm a huge fan of, of aviation art. So I've spent a lot of time looking at, you know, really great painters that can really do airplanes and clouds and, you know, things like technical things like that. So I kind of bring that in with me. And so, you know, when you combine all of that, you know, I think you do end up with something that's, 
different. Everybody's different. I think you just have to kind of give yourself permission to be different and you have to stick with it. You know, yeah. I've been told over the years, you know, you should do this, you should change this, way. you shouldn't do this. And I think, you know, really only yourself, you know what you need to do. Right. And I will, I will say though, there may be lots of landscape painters out there. There's not lots of David Mickle painters out there. I can tell you because I see them every day of the week, you know, so you definitely do have something that stands above uh, the others and not only compositionally, it's super strong, super strong. All your paintings are always compositionally very strong, but your technical skill set is really, uh, you know, above average, way above average. And you can pick out your painting. I mean, I can now pick out your painting anywhere, you know, it, you know, it could be a mile away in a, in a hotel and I would know it was one of your paintings because you have a certain sensibility, the way you lay down the paint, the way you, you do your light, uh, what you choose as your subject matter. So you found, you've tapped into that voice very strongly. Um, and that takes a while. How long did it take you to get to that point, would you say, where it's clear you know what you need to do? Well, I think it, it, it's kind of hard to say because I think when you're doing it yourself, you're so close, you know, and, and you're, you're trying to just sort of do what you do. But like, I, I tend to look at a lot of other artists and there's a lot of other artists that I really admire. And you represent a lot of artists that I really admire. And I look at their work and go, oh, you know, that's, <laughs> I, I wish I had, you know, wish I was done something like that. I, I know one of the things in design school, they said one way you can tell if, if something's really good is if you look at it and go, oh, I wish I would have done that. Uh -huh. you know, I, I do find myself doing that a lot with, with artists. But, you know, looking back, I can, I can think of, you know, when I was painting landscapes, I know when I was, you know, 14 or 15, I was doing a painting of the Grand Canyon. You know, I found a big picture of the Grand Canyon in National Geographic, which, right. you know, right. you really shouldn't, I mean, when you're a, a teenager, you can get away. You're, I was just learning how to paint, but right. it was kind of a stormy Grand Canyon. And, you know, the light was hitting it kind of at a low angle. And, you know, there, it had a lot of really strong shapes with the shadows. And, you know, and in a lot of ways, you know, I'm still trying to do that. You know, I'm still looking for those opportunities for, you know, dramatic lighting, you know, strong shapes, you know, cool textures with the paint, you know, and, and am I capturing what it feels like to be there? And yeah. So Show them the picture of the, you know, move your computer over a little bit and they can see the Grand Canyon behind you. Oh. That you yeah, right there. You can still, yeah, there you go. There's an example of a great one. I have the study for that. I, you, get, you did the little study for that. Uh, painting. But yeah, I've done several, you know, a lot of times they'll work smaller and then they'll scale up big yeah. and, um, to, but to I, I, I was, <laughs> the study for that's in my kitchen. Oh, I love it. Well, you know, I, when I was down at your place last time, at your gallery, um, when I went home, I went through the South Rim of the Grand Canyon and, uh, we, you know, we caught it in March and there wasn't a lot of people there at that time, you know, cause I, South Rim's known for being really crowded and, right. um, so I shot a lot of pictures and those were, that was one that I, I got. Mm. Um, and it was just so much fun. Cause you know, I think when you're from Utah, you tend to see the Grand Canyon from the North. Mm -hmm. So much uh, easier to get to from Utah, go to the North Rim. So, you know, this opportunity to go see the South Rim was uh, just really nice. So I, I do have a lot of, of images from that, but I, I did try and, you know, I sort of the idea of simplifying and focusing on specific elements and things and that's you know I, I think I started small with with some of those but then I thought it would be fun to you know scale up you know for this show and and you know take some of those ideas that work small and and you know do them bigger. And so when you work on a show like you're doing for mine um, we've been talking we've been on this has been on the docket for over I think over a year now do you work on multiple paintings at a time or do you just start one, finish one? How does that work for you? Work on several at a time. Um, although there's usually one that I'm really putting a lot of effort into, like, but I'm also thinking of what's ahead, you know, so I might be going through, you know, what I've shot, um, you know, my library of images, um, you know, working on compositions of something, um, so there might be other things at different stages. And then, 
like the summer when I was working on your show, what I found kind of, and I've done this on other things is, you know, if you get a picture started and maybe two thirds or three quarters of the way through, set it aside and start something else and, and get a bunch going like that. So then, you know, before you pretty close to being done and you feel like you're making good progress and then you can kind of go back and then just zero in on, on each one. And you've kind of lived with them for a little while too. And you find areas that have been bugging you for a while that you got to just fix. And, and then I found a lot of times you can just kind of finish them all off. So, you know, I, it, yeah, at one point I probably had, you know, seven or eight paintings that were like, that I wouldn't call done, but that if most people, when they look at them, they'll think they're done, but there's a lot of stuff I got to still kind of fix. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think living, get, with, yeah, I think living with those and also allowing yourself to dream about them too, right? Oh and yeah. Have them work in your subconscious really works out the, the kinks. I know that that works for me in books when I write my murder mysteries that, you know, it's, it's I get a lot of work done when I'm not awake. Yeah. Know? ruminating in my brain what needs to there's something that's missing or needs to be added or something i'm sure it's the same for you i would think yeah and i think you know you just you just kind of let your mind wander and and i like I, i'll tell people a lot of times you know it's like i'm always thinking about art and I, I think that's probably what makes an artist an artist is you know you wake up in the morning and you, you're thinking about what you got to do and it's kind of like the last thought you have as you as you go to bed you know a lot of times people would say, you know, why are you an artist? And it's like, I don't know, but that's, that's just, I think that's why you do what you do because you just have to, you know, your mind's always thinking about it. And I'm always, you know, looking at the mountains. I'm always looking at the clouds and I'm always thinking about how would I approach that if I was doing that in a painting, you know, and then it's been nice, you know, as, as, you know, the iPhones have come out and, you know, you have a camera with you now all the time. I used to, you know, see stuff all the time and I'd be, you know, bummed because I didn't have my, you know, 35 millimeter camera around with me, but right. you, you know, you couldn't always carry that around with you. But now if you see, see a really nice cloud, you know, set or, you know, something light hitting on the hills, you can just, you know, pull your camera out and, you know, shoot it and take it back. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, I find I'm disappointed with what I, ended up with but if you i found if you scale it up if you redraw it if you put it in a different context um a lot of times you'll find what was there originally that grabbed you so it used to happen with my you know my old 35 millimeter camera with prints i'd come back from like say zion canyon and i'd look at all the prints and i was like this isn't what i saw in my mind these are terrible mm -hmm. but when i when i you know, kind of dig through the photos and I'd find something or I'd crop it and I'd start redrawing it. When you do it big, you'd a lot of times find what was there originally, you know. And you also had that experience. You had that guttural emotional experience of that moment, which I think you can bring back at some time. Well, that, I found too, it, it made all the difference. In, and that's the difference between fine art and illustration. With illustration, a lot of times you're, you're trying to do something that you've never you know, seen or been, or, you know, you're, you're using reference from different places um, with fine art, with like landscape painting like this. These are all places that I've been to, you know, these are places that I've seen myself. Now I know there's artists that will, you know, and I, I've heard this before that, well, you can't really do a landscape unless you paint plain air and you've, you know, you've painted it on location, but you know, I'm, I think, you know, I'm the kind of artist, especially with my commercial background is like, I like gathering the reference materials, bringing it back to the studio and redoing the scene in the studio. Now I've done a lot of plain air painting. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a valuable way of seeing, you know, the landscape. Um, Cause it, obviously there are distortions you get from the camera, but you know, a lot of times I found, you know, that memory of what's there. And then the cameras are now getting good enough that, you know, the, the shadows aren't black anymore. You can see a lot of the color that's going on in the shadows now with, you know, your, your camera. And, and a lot of times I like taking that information and then I'll, I'll change it up a little bit myself to make it how I want to, to see it. But I just, I need that information that I get from the, 
from the reference. And you and besides your landscape paintings, which you're, is what you're known for um, and what people really go after, but you do some phenomenal paintings of planes and things too, or you have in the past, right? Yeah, I love, I love painting airplanes. And, and I've said, you know, on occasion, you know, if I didn't have to have a job or make any money, I'd just probably be drawing airplanes all day. Um, and I, I think airplanes are actually a really good way of learning how to do volume and perspective and light and shade. And, you know, I, I, I grew up drawing airplanes and that's how when I was, you know, at the U and they were teaching us perspective, I understood a lot of those principles because I'd already figured out how, you know, wings look when they're foreshortened and, you know, how volume works, you know, with their, you know, the panel lines and things. And, you know, so, you know, I, but it's, but aviation art is a very different, I think it's a very different field than landscape yeah. painting. So oh, I, yeah. I do it for fun. I do it because I enjoy it. But, you know, my, you know, I, I think the landscapes are, you know, it's something I'm seeing. It's, it's, yeah. you know, this is a reflection of my world. It's these, these are places I've been and that I love. You need to go to the uh, boneyard here in Tucson, where they. I know I've I drove that'd by. Great, that'd be a great painting, by the way. Just yeah. rows and rows and rows of those things, and it's a landscape of you know airplanes, basically bodies to some extent. Oh, I'd do it in a heartbeat. Uh, I want one of those. We should do one. I'm serious for Tucson. We should do one of the boneyard, or you could do it of the air museum too, because they have that as well here. So yeah either one or both would be very interesting i would love to just see it from a standpoint of you know seeing one of your paintings i could see that specifically especially the one of the boneyard where you're it allows you to do the landscape yeah and part of it is that just all these airplane you know that they bring in and decommission them just put them there and forever really yeah but i think that's you know that's always been my hobby and you know I've, I've been I've always been a real history buff and so I I tend to look at the you know I really like the history of a lot of the airplanes and you know I have way too many books on airplanes my wife you know gets kind of frustrated with all of the books I have but you know you know as an artist you know you, you need to have a hobby too you know so I think that's sort of my you know my hobby away from from painting. I'll have to introduce you to Larry Kanzler, when you come out here, Larry's been on the podcast. He's a, he's a painter, but he's known as a musician, but he used to run air shows too. Oh, okay. And he flew and he knew Chuck Yeager and all these people. And, you know, he's very much into everything about airplanes. So those who are listening, if you want to go listen to Larry's uh, podcast, you can. He wrote the song Wildfire with Michael Martin Murphy a long time ago. So he's an interesting guy. He'll, he'll, we'll, we'll hook you up together when you get into town. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to. And that, and that actually was my first, my mom says that was my first word was airplane. So <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> when I was, uh, when I was a teenager, I actually, you know, I, I did think very serious about being a pilot and, you know, looked into that, but I think it was kind of, you know, I'm not, I think most artists tend to not be math people. And I knew I wasn't a math or a physics person. And, you know, the way just seemed clear for, you know, art, but I've, I've always, you know, Definitely, I'm. If plane flies over, I'm looking at it. So, well, I'm glad you didn't become a pilot. I really am on many levels, because uh, we wouldn't have these beautiful paintings that are everywhere, you know. And they're, I mean, you're going to leave a legacy of what you, of Utah, really Utah, Northern Arizona. Um, it seems to be the areas you like to paint the most. Is kind of that Four Corners uh, area. Is that true? Would you say? Well, I, there's just something about the West. You know, there's something about the the open landscapes, and and I do tend to. I mean, I have done a few kind of alpine scenes, but I I know that you know I went on a trip to the redwoods, and mm. I probably and the redwoods are beautiful. You know, they're gorgeous trees, but I probably and this is before digital cameras, but I I took probably about two or three painting or two or three photos of the redwoods and then on the drive back to salt lake you know going between reno and wendover in nevada you know on i-80 i probably shot two mm -hmm. or three rolls of film because we had these really gorgeous rolling clouds and you know the, there were these shadows on the hills and you know and my you know, i was traveling with my mom this is before i was I was married and my mom was just like what are you doing you just came from one of the most beautiful places in the world with the, you know these redwoods and we're out you know in this you know this open 
space that I think most people tend to just not look at. And, and I was just like, this is, I love this landscape. You know, I love this openness. And, and actually one of the first paintings that I sold to, you know, was in the Utah State Collection was from this series of paintings that I, or these series of photos that I took in Nevada. You know, and it was, and I was aware of Maynard Dixon at the time, and sort of. So I was looking at these, these uh, clouds and shadows, and and to me, it was just that was the landscape that inspired me, and it still does. Yeah. Do you ever put figures in any of your work, or houses, or anything like that? I well, mean, I, I tend to. I I did a lot of figure, you know, painting and drawing when I was a student, but I I usually tend to shy away from figures. Um, they just, for some reason, I've just, it seems like when you introduce a figure into something, it becomes a different kind of painting, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, um, you know, I can draw portraits, I can draw likenesses, but, you know, I tend to, you know, at least at work when I have to do a, a portrait, then, you know, they always say, well, my mouth doesn't quite look like this. And even though you've got it exactly, you know, I think it, it kind of takes something where it's like, you really have to like you know, somehow connect with the person on a, on a different kind of level to get sort of the essence of their soul. And I think I'm a little more, like I'm probably more shy and I tend to, well, you know, I'll just, can I take your picture so I can do this, this <laughs> painting here. And then to the landscapes are nicer because it's like, they're not gonna get up and walk away. You mm -hmm. can sit for, right. you know, hours and look at a mountain and, and just get right. the right, you know, light and, and so I, I think I tend to relate to the, the landscape more. Now with buildings, I've done a lot of paintings of, my, my parents are both from Cache Valley and, and I really like sort of the working rural Utah or Western farms. Um, so I do like, you know, real working buildings, you know, like yeah. sheds and silos and, you know, you know, barns that aren't necessarily, you know, made to look like tourist barns, but like real yeah. working barns, tractors and, you know, and, and of course, you know, coming, I, I like technical things, so I, I do like that, but, you know, I, I tend not to send that stuff your way. Um, no, I've seen it online that you've done, and I like it. It's really beautiful, you know, and technically proficient for sure. But I do try and capture, I think, what the place is, and there, there is something about, you know, I think Cache Valley especially, you know, because that's where my parents are both from, and, and my relatives are all dairy farmers and and so mm -hmm. even though i don't know a thing about farming and you know i i wouldn't know what to do with with, with land except for painted but yeah. you know I, I grew up you know playing in those fields going in barns you know i i know what real milk tastes like before it's pasteurized right. you know um mm -hmm. you know i've fallen in a, a you know a corral full of manure and you know mm -hmm. I, I know how that i know i know the smells and all of that yeah yeah no i love it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up in that kind of environment too, but from a distance. Yeah, all my friends were ranchers and cattlemen in eastern New Mexico. So yeah, there is a sensibility. And those buildings are fantastic, especially the ones that are kind of, to me, the ones that are abandoned are really, I find the most interesting because it's like, you can see this life that lived there, you know, maybe a couple of generations and now it's gone and why and where mm -hmm. and it just kind of goes back to the land. Ultimately, they just kind of dissolve. Back, yeah you know except for the elm trees that are just kind of barely hanging on you know you wouldn't even know that there might have been a house there yeah to me there's something about especially the farms that are are still working that it feels like those buildings do kind of belong there you know the you know they they you know even though they do kind of stand out you know they you know the, the ones that have been there for a long time i feel like they are as much a part of the landscape is the mountains and fields too you know so yeah. i i do love and when i'm you know driving places i'm always I, I i am a careful driver i'm looking at the road but i am always looking at you know what's going on around and i, I love the you know sort of the open fields and farms and yeah, stuff. yeah i'm with you on that so what would you tell as we kind of come to the end of this uh, uh this call what would you tell young artists who are considering Maybe, eh, maybe I want to be an artist. I think I can draw well. I've been noticed and that kind of thing. What does it take to become an artist these days? Well, I think it's probably like anything. Um, you have to have a belief in yourself um, and you have to be able to deal with rejection. Um, but you also have to know that you have to learn, I think, from 
you know, when you don't get in a show, um, maybe think about why you didn't get in, um, but you have to keep doing it. You have to, you know, there've been plenty of points where I, I never got so discouraged that I thought, well, I can't be an artist, I can't do this, but there certainly is, you know, like when you get out of college, there's not a lot of open doors. It's like you're not gonna, you know, like, like the galleries aren't going, hey, we need, you know, yeah. we're dying for artists here. <laughs> you know, you have to, you have to figure out, you know, what you have, you know, what can you do that people want and, and be able to work hard at it um, and, and do it a lot. And, and to me, I found, even though I like, you know, we've talked about, I have a lot going on, you know, I have a big, a lot of times people think, oh, you can't have a big family if you're an artist, you can't be able to afford it. You know, it's like, no, you, you, you can, but you, you have to work consistently. Uh, and I know for a, this is long before I got married. Um, and I was, you know, I had plenty of time after I was out of school and, you know, I'd come home from work, you know, you'd think, well, I'd go have fun with my friends, but I forced myself to paint for at least an hour or two every day, or I'd come home, you know, after being out with friends and I, you know, if I hadn't painted that day, I would still paint for an hour. And I think sometimes people think, oh, you know, you got to paint eight hours a day, you know, to, to make it. I think that's a little extreme. I think I tell people if you paint an hour every day, you know, six or seven days a week, by, you know, the end of a few months, you'll be surprised at how much you, you get done. I mean, if you think about it, if, if I played golf for, you know, an hour every day, if I hit you know, if I hit chip shots for an hour every day, I'd be an amazing chipper. If I hit tennis balls, maybe, day, maybe hour. you would be. <laughs> Golf is well, see, I, I, unreli- I used to play a lot, but I never practiced, you know, uh-huh. so you go out like, you know, three or four times a year. Right. And, you know, but if you, you know, but if you put in that work, that's, that's right. It's true. You know, you, you may not be a pro at a pro level, but if you, you know, if you put that time in, um, and, it, and it's not something that you have to necessarily change your life either. What I, what I think is if you just do an hour, you know, yeah, do it for an hour. And consistently. And, and just, consistently. That's the key yeah. is consistently. Because I think people give up after a few months or a couple of years or they go, oh, I just can't do it. Um, you know, it, it took me, even though I, I did sell paintings here and there, you know, I didn't start really getting into I got into a gallery in 2003 and I got into the the one that I really sold a lot in 2006 and see I graduated in the 94 so there was you know probably 10 or 12 years before you know I really kind of got into that you know where I'm selling work consistently now I think a lot of times people think well you get out of you know university you know when's the money going to come in right away (laughs) <laughs> and it's hard, I think, a lot of times with art, you know, you just realize it's it's down the road. Um, yeah. And there may be other things that you need to do in between, but you have to decide. And for me, it's like, I never wanted to do anything else, though. You know, I, I always wanted to be a landscape painter. You know, I always wanted to do what I'm doing. I'm painting the stuff right now. I'm, you know, I'm not doing it because... I know I can sell it. I'm doing it because I love these kind of landscapes. I love seeing the light on the side of the, you know, a, a rock formation or a mesa. I love seeing clouds, you know. And so, you know, you, you have to find that kind of motivation. So it keeps you going. So when you get through those, you have those hard times and you, you, you sometimes take those knocks, you know, you don't get in a show you want or, you know, you, sometimes you have a client and they reject your work. Um, and it happens a lot. You know, you get used to it as an artist, but, you know, you just, you know, you, you kind of get sort of this thick skin. You get tough, you know. Um, you don't want to get bitter, but you also, you know, like occasionally you have people will say, say things like, you know, well, it's, you know, art's not, I don't know, art's not a real field or whatever. And you're just like, no, this is, this is what I do. And I'm proud to do it. I love doing it. And I, I do get very bothered when people say, they tell young people, don't go into art. You can't make a living at it. I know recently I had some guy in a meeting, you know, said to the whole you know group, tell your kids not to go into art. And I called him on it. You know, I was, there was no way I was going to let somebody get away with 
saying that. I mean, it's been a hard road, but I haven't, you know, I'm glad I have done this. You know, I'm so happy with, you know, this choice of profession. I'm, I wouldn't want to do anything else. So I do hate it when people will say, oh, art is, you know, so unstable. And, you know, <laughs> if you love it, you'll find a way to make it work. Yeah, that's right. Well, I think that's great advice, especially the rejection one. You know, I haven't heard that from an artist, but you're right. I mean, that's a good, that's a big component of it. You know, you do a body of work and you might not sell anything and you put all this effort and energy. And that doesn't mean you're not a good artist. It doesn't mean the paintings aren't good. It can mean a variety of things. It could mean you got a crappy dealer who doesn't do his good job. You know, it could mean that you were selling in a pandemic and people didn't want to buy. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that things don't sell. And um, you do, I think as an artist, a professional artist, you have to be able to accept those kind of criticisms. And when a gallery doesn't want to represent you, you can't get upset. I mean, you can use it for motivation. It's really a great motivator. You know, if there's a really great gallery you want to get in, they keep returning, you know, rejecting you. Well, just get better and go to other galleries. And then when they come to you, you can go, no. <laughs> Say, yeah. No, I, you should have done it when I tried to get in five years ago. Um, so I, I do think that's true. I think the path isn't always how you picture it, you know, when you're in school or when you're first starting out. But I think ultimately, yeah, there's, there might be a gallery that you were dying to get into. I, I know there was a place in Salt Lake as a student I always loved, but, you know, I've never, you know, I know they rejected me once and I've never kind of been back, but I've, you know, I've been in some, I found some other great places, including your place that, you know, I'm so happy that I'm in, you know, it's like, yeah, who, you know, it's okay because if you keep at it you'll find doors that you didn't expect doors right. will open for you people and if you're professional and if you're nice you know and that's the one nice thing about artists and i found is that other artists are usually really nice and they're really you know it's like you know you, there's a lot of respect between artists because i think we know how hard it is to do it and yeah. so i've never really come across another artist who has been really mean or not nice to work with yeah, you're in a club. It's a small club, you know, and uh, to, you have to pay your dues to get into that club. And those dues are hard work, long hours, rejection, and hopefully, and not always, but hopefully that you find your career and you find your path where you can make a, you know, a living and hopefully a good living. It doesn't always happen for all artists. I know artists that struggled for years and don't do it. So, but ultimately, I think that there may not be a better profession than being an artist in some respects, you know, cause you're around beauty, creativity, you're making things that are amazing. And as you said, your fellow artists all are really interesting people. Uh, anyone who's a creative person, I think is a very interesting, unique person. It's, they're a different, they have a different sensibility to how they look at the world, which we need. We need it desperately actually. Yeah. Well, I've noticed we don't really stand out in a crowd of people. You know, I think a lot of times, especially with, you know, with my job, you can kind of see certain people go into certain professions and, you know, the artists, I think, tend to be the quiet people on the side of the room, you know, and, and I think most of the time we don't stand out with our personalities, but we let our, at least for me, I try and let my work do the talking for me, you know. Well, it does. David, your work works does the talking and it has a very law, large, loud megaphone because it it really moves me. I'm thrilled to have you as an artist. I'm thrilled to have you in my own collection in my home. So, and I'm excited about our, our you know, your one man show coming up December 4th, which is going to be fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it very much. Do you know which child's coming down to the show yet? Um. We're not sure how we're going to work it out yet. I know I'm going to, you know, come down, you know, this month and I'll probably have a few with me when we drop off the work. But uh, my daughter, who my 16 yeah. year old, she just raves about your gallery. She had so much fun when she came. I know, I want her to come back. She's fantastic. You should tell her she should come back. We'd love to see her. <laughs> yeah, so I think I'll be able to bring at least, you know, two or three other kids with me. I think it helps my wife to get some other kids out of the of the house but they do they do like the trip down to tucson yeah great and they'll remember it too you know and yeah. this is a big deal 
you know, having a big show, one man show is a big deal. So you worked and put in a lot of effort. People don't realize how much effort goes into it on, you know, on your part. So. Well, one man shows are kind of intimidating because you have to fill the room yourself. I think group shows, you know, you can do one or two and everybody right. else is contributing. This right. one is, it's all you. So, yeah. I, <laughs> Well, it's all you, David. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'll give you a call. And we'll talk later about some things that we get coming up for the show. But thanks for taking the time. I'm excited about the show. And it was nice to be able to spend some time and learn a little more about you. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. All right. We'll talk soon. Really soon. Okay. All right, Dave. Bye-bye. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.